what makes great neighborhoods great neighborhoods in the city of cleveland is you have to have a good school and you have to have a safe neighborhoods yeah. and and really uh, that along with opportunities is what makes a healthy neighborhood and uh, you know we had it and you know i want all of cleveland to have that yeah now you you could have been a police officer why go the route of uh this elected official you know why go this route and not the law enforcement like per se a policeman you know so much of life is opportunity and i was afforded the opportunity to start working at the cleveland municipal court when i was young i was 22 and just working down there uh, continuing my education at night I, I graduated my undergrad um at night um while i worked you know it gave me a goal and the goal was when i saw those lawyers practicing in the courtroom you know i made the decision yeah you know what um by by some hard work i could do it as well and um that's what i did i, I continued to work in the day i applied for law school i went to law school uh, at night it was four years at night after work it was a long long haul but you know I, I accomplished it and i was i was glad i did because that was the goal i had set when the county changed over the legal system and became with the county executive did you see an opportunity right there to create change in the community like you wanted to you know i i supported that I, i'm a the prosecutor now and I, my views have changed a bit but really you know what i my first real you know i was a probation officer i worked with people i would interview people i would try to get people on the right path you know i really learned a lot because i would sit in that office and i would interview people from throughout cleveland work with them and try to get them on the right path so it really molded my thinking and how we have to help people and get them on the right path because that is so critical and then um i became a cleveland city councilman in um 1999 and it was in that position really on the ground level of politics people will tell you there's no more difficult a job than to be a councilman and you are on the ground level of dealing with people meeting their most basic needs you know whether it's uh, the issues with the neighbor next door or issues with their street needing plowed or paved or maybe there's break-ins on the street there's a, a, a house got burglarized or there was a violent assault somewhere and so I would talk to literally dozens and dozens of people every day who would reach out to me to try to help you know deal with their issues that they had with the city of Cleveland whether it was building department or the police department or the service department but just meeting people in their most basic needs and um it, it, it is the most demanding job in in politics um but it is also the most rewarding because you really can change the difference in a neighborhood well you say you came up in a neighborhood where there was a a, a, a fairly decent school where you say it was a great great schools where you were and it was homes there basically you know full homes with moms and dads and things of that nature and you're saying that we need to have that in all around cleveland you know what what the is is now that i sit in the position of prosecutor and i have to look at case after case of really tragedy oftentimes what i'm reading is just tragic occurrences Youthful violence at that a great deal of that but just you know the the tragedies like we had six weeks ago where that young six-year-old girl was laying in her bed laying sleeping in is some group of individuals that a drive by shooting into her house and she lost her life you know i i ha we have video of an individual shooting an ak-47 22 times into that house and that poor child along with other children quite frankly it was a miracle more didn't die but you know uh, we need to have a community where six-year-olds can go to bed and feel safe and be safe and wake up safe and when I see just senseless violence like that it, it breaks my heart and it, it makes me want to do better and it makes me want the city to do better because I know we are a better city and sadly what we're oftentimes seeing in Cleveland is that we all know 99.9999 percent of the citizens of Cleveland just want to live in a safe healthy happy community they want their children to be able to walk to the store to get a gallon of milk or walk to school safely and we need to deliver that we need to make that in every neighborhood and you know when i see these occurrences it just it, it makes me know that we got to continue to work hard we got to continue to get the message out because there is another way and we have to just stop this 
back and forth tit for tat violence that we see and you know that's that's my goal is prosecutors to work with these low level offenders get them on the right path before they pick up arms and use them against other people but working with them to get them into programming get them into programs get them opportunities so that they can live a complete full life without crossing over into breaking the law and you know that's what we need to do well you've been in term now in office for going on three years and when when you first got in people really were chomping at the bit about Mr. O'Malley, what are you going to do about the youthful gun violence? What's some of the strides you made as far as those programs that you're speaking of to address those issues? You know what, the first thing we did when, when, I, when I came in is that when I came into the office, within the first month in 2017, we learned there was 1,400 cases that hadn't been processed, and they were sitting in an active file in the computer system. And we had to begin looking at all of those cases. And quite frankly, there was about 70 sexual assaults that had been sitting there, along with other violent offenses, that had been just sitting there. And the whole issue came to our attention because we were contacted by a family whose daughter had been sexually assaulted. And nothing had happened with that, that, that case for like five months. And then we were also getting contacted by the local police department saying, why aren't these cases moving? And we learned that they were just placed in an active file. So what we did was we had to begin opening all those files, working with the local agencies, and trying to bring some justice to those victims of those violent crimes. And so we did that. But what it also revealed is that there was a weakness in how cases were processed in juvenile court. And working with the juvenile court administration, we began looking at other models on how you should process juvenile cases because the goal is to work with juveniles before their level of violence increases and before they're doing the things like we see where they're picking up a gun and robbing or carjacking or shooting into houses or, 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 or just shooting people and killing them. And so what we did, we, we have a new intervention center where kids can get evaluated. An intervention center. Yes. What they're doing now, and it just kicked in in the last six months, we got, a, we got a state grant to the juvenile court. And what they're doing is when kids come, in, come into the juvenile system, they're giving them an assessment. They're looking at psychologically, socially, academically, physically. Do, you know, do they need glasses? Are they not doing well in school because they can't see the board? Things that will help to improve them. And then when the, these individuals come in front of the judge, the judge has a fuller understanding of ac exactly what that individual needs so that we can tailor resolutions to really help that child succeed. Right. So we just implemented that. Um, it, right now we, we're doing, I think we're up to about 2,000 cases, 2,000 individuals that have been evaluated in that manner, and we're bringing more and more of the cases in there. To, we are going to get to a point in the near future. Are, are you starting to see more positive outcomes and results in these Yes. Young people and, and lives? It, yes, absolutely. And we're, we're also seeing is where we need to work harder. We have to make sure it's critical. Where is that at? Well, it's critical. We have to, you know, for instance, um, making sure we get all the parents, all the families participating, because sometimes parents are busy, they're working, but it's critical that they are active and involved in the process. So we're trying to do better. What is the best, better way to contact people? What is the best way to get people here? Do we have to provide them with transportation opportunities? What is it going to take to get complete family involved? Because that's a key to s success in this situation, right. is getting families involved. Now, now you know, we, we talk about the jail, and, and I had some people on this show that, that took issue with the inhumane conditions down at the county jail. And I think you had issues, or at least, the, you know, you were address, seeking to address the public's concerns about that even... Is it true that uh, members of your staff and office were um, investigating Ahmad Budish about you know the jail situation? Well, let me just start from the beginning of that situation. You know, we became aware that there was issues. My office became aware, and my investigators became aware that there was issues in county government, and so the, an investigation was began on on different aspects of county government. And part of the issues that it led to was looking at we were getting information that there was improprieties going on in the county jail and then right then as well in 2018 we started seeing a rash of 
horrible deaths within the county jail and we started looking at why is that happening what is going on and then we started getting information that there was guards corrections officers who were being very you know very physically violent with the with the detainees in the county jail and so we started looking at that when they came across your desk what was going through your mind when I saw the videos of what was occurring in county jail I was complaining oh there's certain videos yeah huh Video. Yeah, we got the video to owl you too. <laughs> well, there was complete videos, and it first and foremost, I was disgusted by the behavior I saw in those videos, and extremely disappointed that occurrences like that could possibly occur in a county facility. Unfortunately, because there was a conflict, I had to put those employees with the attorney general because I can't civilly represent the county because lawsuits started getting filed while at the same time investigating people who are the named in lawsuits. So my employees went to work under the direction of the uh, Attorney General and the investigations continue, but much of the trouble has been revealed in the county jail. They still need to go a long way in improving it. Um, we're having meetings right now to determine whether we should build and construct a new facility that's more state-of-the-art, that treats better people better and gives them a more humane condition to while they're detained. Um, so there's a lot of hopefully through these tragedies and, and violent acts that occurred, first and foremost, those people are going to be held accountable who did those things. Um, but also maybe this is the road that has been created to allow us to improve the living conditions uh, for those who are, who, are, who are currently in the county jail. So hopefully out of a very horrible and tragic uh, situation, we can, we can in improve the situation uh, in the future. Now, when you were running for office, it was noted that you uh, had a comprehensive plan to even build bridges in the community with people so, you know, corruption wouldn't get out of hand and things of that nature. How do, how do we look to get past, you know, events like 137 shots? You know, how, how, how does someone like you in your office plan to, to ease that, you know, situation where something like that doesn't happen again? That was like overlooked a little bit. Well, a a absolutely. But, well, you know, I think the thing that we need to do, and I think uh, working with law enforcement, holding them accountable when need be, when they do things wrong, but also ensuring and working with the administration to make sure these officers get the appropriate training and that they're screening officers correctly and getting them training so that those type of horrific tragedies never occur within our community because um, that those events, not only did they destroy a family, destroy an individual's life, but two lives, but they left a black eye on this city and this community nationally, yeah. quite frankly, internationally, is that how could a tr horrific event like that happen anywhere right. in, in, in this country? So, you know, I think training's gotten, be gotten better. Um, you know, I know Mayor Jackson has worked and worked with his the leadership in his police department to get the word out to train people. To You know, it... I think the key is that officers need to become a part of the community. They need to know who lives in the community. They need to be a part of it. You know, one You're of not afraid to hold them accountable, the police, when, they, when they're out no, in violation? Absolutely not. You know, we have, quite frankly, we've indicted several police officers recently and convicted them. I know we had the one in Garfield Heights with the uh, uh, sexual assault on the, uh, on the uh, girl, um, the young girl underage girl. Um, I think he got eight years in prison. So, you know, I'm not afraid of doing what's right. Yeah. And Because this is where you came up from. And, and you know what? It's my job. So whether it's investigating people in county government or investigating police officers or if there was anyone. I mean, we just all have to live by the same standards. Yeah. And we have to follow the law and, and you know, that's what I have to do. I have to make sure I fairly and impartially enforce the law. Well, that's what we're looking for in the community. You know, that's what we hear a lot. You know, we also, Mike, we had the Imperial Women Organization. You ever heard of them? Yes, I have. 
that came on the show, Kathy Ray Coleman and them. Absolutely. And uh, back when that Anthony Saul stuff was going on, you know, the the brutal rape and murder of 11 women here in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, those of you watching nationally and internationally, that went on right here. Absolutely. And, you know, those women took issue with the fact that it was rape kits being untested. And people asked you about that and what kind of progress was has been made thus far since you've been in office with that? Well, we are down to less than 1,000 rape kits left. When you know, when I came into office, and quite frankly, you know, the, the rape kit task force was formed bef before I came to that office, but there was, I think, roughly 7,000 rape kits in this county that were untested, 5,000 plus from the city of Cleveland. And we are working our way through that, and we are now down to the last thousand. Did you put any new wrinkles in that? I mean, because they started before you got in office. They, that started before I got in office, but it continues, and we are down. Like I said, we are down to the last, you know, the last thousand uh, rape kits. Um, but we are over it, over 750 indictments, women who did not receive the justice that they deserve because. The individuals who had assaulted them have never been brought to court and never had to uh, face the consequences for the violent actions that they had committed against those those individuals. So um, that should be over within the next 12 months. That chapter, that dark chapter in our history of really not respecting and addressing the sexual assaults and violence committed against women. And I hope um, working with the city of Cleveland's uh, sexual, assault, sexual assault unit, that you know that stuff never happens again where rape kits are placed on. And there's a state law now that they have to be um, uh, sent for testing. So working with the city of Cleveland's police department to make sure, because it, most of the kits were from Cleveland, to make sure that that never happens again. Yeah. Now, now Mike, are, are, are you what they call a stickler to the Constitution? Do you like to keep it close to the vest with that and, and sharp with that? You know, absolutely. Part of, part of our, our my job is certainly to follow the laws of the state of Ohio, but also to respect the Constitution of both the state of Ohio and the United States of America. So, so, certainly, yes. For instance, there was just a, as you know, not too long ago, the last election cycle, uh, the citizens of Ohio, through a, 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 a petition and initiative, uh, put Marcy's Law, which gives victim rights to uh, victims of crime, and that was placed in the Ohio Constitution. And that completely changed how we, we always respected victims, but now it demands that they be notified, that they're, we have to notify them so they can be present at all proceedings. And it just put an additional layer of protection to make sure victims and their families are completely involved in the processing of the cases uh, downtown. So, for instance, that's like a state constitutional amendment that was just put in place to protect victims. Yeah. Well, Mike, are you dismayed at citizens that, you know, their cases come in front of your office and they might have worked the judicial process legally and something went wrong in their case, but they're operating according to constitution and they might not be under the dur jurisdiction of a prosecutor. Do you take haste with those circumstances? Well, I'm not sure if I follow, but I can tell you, we have um, established a conviction integrity unit in my office. Um, it's under the direction of Criminal Chief Russ Ty, and we look at current activities as well as past sentences that uh, and convictions that individuals have received. And right now we're at 10 individuals whose sentences we reviewed, their convictions we reviewed, and th that they have in fact then um, had their convictions overturned. Or if it's a situation where the facts have changed and we're really not sure, we try to work with their defense attorneys to see if we can come up with a, with a, a uh, a resolution that really brings justice to that individual in that case. But several individuals, for instance, we had one case where the individual hadn't even been sentenced and uh, Criminal Chief Ty actually sent the evidence to a another agency to have it analyzed even further and before that individual was sentenced we overturned the conviction because we now knew that in fact through that additional evidence that that conviction would have been wrong. So we're trying to proactively work on the current cases to make sure we get everyone right, but just as importantly, we're willing to review what happened in the past 
and through the Conviction Integrity Unit. We have a board of citizens of Cuyahoga County who review these cases with Mr. Ty, and then they make the recommendations to me, and we come to a resolution that really tries to bring justice to these individuals who may have been wrongly, wrongfully convicted. Was that on the civil or criminal level? No, that's on the criminal level. So we have um, worked with people. We've actually, like Ruel Saylor, we had released, for instance, Evan King we had released, where we work with individuals, we look, sometimes it's new evidence. You look at now, not new evidence, but because their technology has evolved, um, it gives us a better opportunity to analyze perhaps evidence from the past that then gives us a better understanding of what may have occurred, which is what happened in the Evan King case. Um, and then, so, so we are always willing to stick down. We have uh, an application process for people who feel they're wrongly convicted. They submit their application to my office, and uh, Russ Ty and the uh, review board will look at those cases. We send investigators out to do more uh, uh, research and, and look for more evidence. But we're willing to also look at the past, and I think that's important. The, the, do you take do you take issue with those claiming their sovereignty? And like you know, filing in a clerk's office to represent themselves. Do you personally take issue with that? Do you? No, you know what? You know the legal system is for everyone, and some people try to use it in different manners. And um, but you know the system just has to be fair for all people. And you know one of my goals when I was running for office was to make it fair and to try to make it a level playing for people for all people. So I have no qualms when people may come in and file a complaint or feel that their issues are not being addressed. And I think everybody should should be able to state their piece and then we should work the best to try to resolve their issues. Well, be candid with me, Mr. O'Malley. You know, when, um, of course, you heard of the Morris, science, uh, Mor Mor Morris right? You heard, heard of the Morris, people start study Morris science and, study and, and, and stuff like that. No, I, 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 no, I, I honestly, I, I don't. The more you don't, you don't no. really follow that. You don't no. really stuff, do stuff like that. But you do, you do know people who uh, file uh, paperwork according to the Constitution. Right. Yes, and, I've seen that. And, and and you say you don't really have no issue with that, and you have people in your office l willing to work with individuals. Like yeah, that. I know there are groups of people who do consultations. Well, no, the reason why I ask you that because it's 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 a prevailing feeling going around that. You know, in the county, there's a war going on with individuals that's exercising their constitutional rights. And, you know, I just want to know if that's true coming from a, a county administrator now, like you know, yourself. I can tell you this. We file thousands of cases. We have thousands, you know, we file thousands of cases. We certainly handle dozens and dozens of cases civilly. But really, people trying to do, um, and there's a word for it that slips my mind right now, but we really don't have too much of the people who try to do the constitutional filings, that's, those are few and very few and far between. You said that's few and far between. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then so when you do see them, see those cases happen, you know, you, you, it's like in a, a magnet. You're attracted to it and, and you, you attack the case. Is that the case? Or? No, generally they're just really footnotes in a day. I, don't, I think we may have had one or two in, in the last the three years that I've been in office, and my civil department just handles those and, and works with the people to try to address whatever the issue is. Yeah, yeah. Because what I've come to notice, a lot of times, you know, people just be misguided in how they go about things, but at the same time, they just want to live a prosperous life. They want to live a, 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 a law-abiding life. Absolutely. You know, I truly believe most Clevelanders, most people in this county, that's all they want. They want to live in safety. They want to live a law-abiding life. We, as the best as government can, try to provide them with opportunities. I think if everybody has an opportunity to do well, most people will do well. But they need an opportunity. They need a good education, and they just they you know they will do well naturally if you give them that. How do you keep your deputies under you in check, and? you know, where, where they're fair and, and balanced in, in, in their approach like you are? How do you keep well, that? Well, the marching I or orders I, I give to all of my prosecutors, it's not about, there's no wins or losses. We try to seek justice, and, and that's the marching orders. And what I tell everybody when I hire them, I tell them, you have one order while you're in this office. Always do what's right. And so when you give them that perspective, because sometimes right is somebody's acquitted. 
and that means justice is served because whether it's a jury or the judge they sit there and they hear the facts the evidence present is presented to them in sometimes there's it's an acquittal sometimes it's a conviction but that's the system in so my staff knows that it's not about convictions or or it's it's just letting the system work for people be fair be square when you're in the courtroom follow the rules present the case and the way it comes out whether it's a judge's verdict or a jury's verdict that that's justice and and that is what if somebody is acquitted of a case you know that's what should happen and you shake the defense attorney's hands you wish the individual well in that they go on and proceed with their life and that they're successful and they do well by others how often is it that you're brought to speak on the stand in cases where your deputies brought you in under their own you know hey hey sir mr. O'Malley can can I use you to speak on behalf of what I'm trying to prosecute in a particular case I never generally I don't go into court to so I'm never needed to go testify in a case you know we generally what we'll do is we'll have witnesses whether it's a a traffic accident where somebody's intoxicated and we've just had a tragic one not too long ago in our community where somebody lost their life if we have a situation like that or there's a shooting or a felonious assault of something you know generally what we do is we get the witnesses together if there's videotape we get the videotape if there's DNA evidence and pretty much we put our case put cases on we prepare the evidence we we gather the evidence and we we put it into into the case and what you'll see is you know that stuff whether it's a videotape there's so much videotape available juries or the judge can sit there look look at our test results certainly the defense has an opportunity to cross-examine those who are presenting that evidence but you know that's just the system working and like I said however those cases are resolved whether it's through a conviction or acquittal I'm good with so I we back play a T that's me Hollywood in the hood doing it really really great you know I about to say great doing it really really big you know I mean with a great guest right here and mr. Michael Malley you know I mean the Cuyahoga County prosecutor Mike you know I really commend you for wanting to be fair and impartial you know because I feel that's what's needed and me having this platform you know that's what I try to do bring people on let them speak their peace and let let them have their say in their own words that way I don't judge them and you know their work speak for them for itself now uh, going forward you know what do you seek to accomplish and what do you hope your legacy will be in office well going forward now uh, working with the administration of co and county government what we're trying to do now is establish mental health diversion centers both east and west God knows we need that <laughs> because what we've seen is a lot of tragedies um, that have occurred in this community because people who are simply uh, suffering from mental health issues have become intertwined within the criminal justice system and that never has a good ending in what we need to do with people who have mental health issues we need to deal with the mental health issues and keep them out of the criminal justice system and try to get them stabilized and on the right path and so there seems to be a groundswell of support for that um, I think the momentum's on our side so I'm hopeful in the next six months to a year that we establish centers and work towards diverting people from the criminal justice system you know I we're looking currently because of the situation in, involving the county jail we have experts coming in who have done an analysis on, on the current population of the county jail in 45 percent uh, of the individuals in the county jail uh, have been taking uh, drugs for uh, mental health reasons and it's 45 percent it, it was more higher I knew there was a percentage but I didn't yeah. think it was almost <laughs> half <laughs> we need to work towards diverting those people before their interaction within the criminal justice system hopefully these mental health centers can do that where family members or law enforcement or, or 
EMS units can take people who are having a mental health crisis to these centers so that there's professionals there who can work with that population and work with those families and try to get those individuals healthy. And if we do that, our community will be far, far ahead. We'll have less interactions with the criminal justice system. Hopefully the population and county jail will continue to decline. And we will have less people becoming intertwined with the criminal justice system. And that will be a win-win. And that's my next goal over the next few years is to work with the county administration. There's a lot of community groups who are pushing it as well, but working towards getting mental health centers established on both sides of town to help with this critical need. Now, one last question, and I, I know you got to go. Um, how, is the fervor there to gain the trust of the public as it was when you first came into office? I think every day in office where people see we're doing a good job, we're working with them, not against them, um, I think every day gets easier. But, you know, again, when I started this interview, I talked to you about wanting to work towards making every neighborhood safe. So that means working with the Kevin Conwells of the world, the Joe Joneses of the world, working with all the Cleveland councilmen, working with the entering suburbs that are having difficult issues as well, working hand in hand with them, trying to help the individuals and get them Do out of the system. you have an open door policy? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have constant communication. Most individuals, um, the elected officials throughout the county, if they have a problem in their neighborhood, they reach out to call me. Certainly defense attorneys contact me all the time with the issues with their clients. So I have an open door. I'm, I'm available. I'm open. I'm transparent. And I'm there to help the people of Cuyahoga County. That's what I like to hear. Congratulations, hey, Mr. Thank you for having me. And again, it's been a pleasure to come to